Uh, first thing I'm going to say is I think the people back here, I think I look here at St. John back in 1877, I'd like to see the day like this. Uh, <laughs> uh, my name is Brian Middleton. I'm with the Brethren of the Historical Society and uh, respond for this event in the conjunction with the, the library. Um, just I'm going to make a couple of announcements before uh, I turn it over to uh, Mr. Reed. Uh, our bathrooms are right behind everybody over here. I'd also like to uh, say if, uh, if anybody wishes to join the Brunswick Historical Society or make, make a donation uh, to help us run the, the Loyal Center of St. John, you know, where I was looking for donations and, uh, and new members. Um, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Lindsay Warner. I'm the head of adults and young adult services here at the St. John Street Public Library. So I just want to welcome you all to this event. Um, for those of you interested in doing research, we have a um, wonderful facility here at the library. Um, we'd love to encourage people interested in doing their own research to come visit, come ask us questions. So just before we begin, um, we here at the St. John Free Public Library respectfully acknowledge the territory in which we gather as the ancestral homeland of the Willisquoi and Mi'kmaq peoples. We strive for a respectful relationship with all the peoples of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together. Um, so this is going to be a fantastic presentation. Um, <coughs> the book. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, all right. And uh, also uh, directly behind us here are some books for sale. Uh, right here by, uh, by Cole. And we might even build the hit signal. <laughs> I might do. You might do that. And uh, after the presentation, uh, uh, if you have any questions or any, and, and uh, questions for the author, you know we might uh, be able to tell you tell the answer or at least tell you a big story. Okay. Thank you, Roger. No problem. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, I start off with space time inexplicably linked. And I've been looking forward to this presentation. Louder, please. Sorry, I've been looking forward Louder, to this presentation. Really? really loud, okay. So I've been looking forward to this presentation because 145 years ago, where we're at right now would be a wash in flames. So if we can, can we all use our imaginations? And you might want to close your eyes. You might, if you feel comfortable. If you don't feel comfortable, don't close your eyes. But I want you to know what it was like standing here 145 years ago. So this would have been a warehouse. We would likely have been clerks trying to make our way up into the business. And the orders came down. There's a fire down the street. It's, it's starting to grow. Start boxing everything up and get out. Okay, so we're starting to shake a bit, aren't we? Like feel that, that there's a fire coming and we know about fires in St. John. There's been a lot of fires, okay? So there's a fire and we've heard the bells. So the church bells from the uh, cathedral, from Trinity, from St. Andrew crossed uh, the uh, way in uh, in Carlton. They're all ringing five tolls, five times. And what does that mean? Fire around the Union Street dock area. That was their way of saying where the fire was. Five tolls, five times. We can no longer hear the bells. All we hear now is roar, the roar of the fire. And it's interlaced with screams. And it's the screams of men, women, children. <laughs> then we're going to hear more. We're going to hear the pounding of horse hooves and wagons as people are trying to get out of this area as fast as humanly possible. And it's 2.30 in the afternoon and it's a sunny day. But guess what? It was dark because a big black cloud of smoke 
comes over and instantly turns day to night. And then we start feeling heat. The heat of this fire was described as being absolutely incredible. We start feeling heat through the walls. Who's getting nervous now? Remember, we're clerks. We want to stand by our position. Is anyone getting a little nervous now? <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to make you a little bit more nervous. Back window. So we're looking out here. We're tossing. If it could be tossed, we're going to toss stuff right out that window. If it wasn't, uh, if it wasn't uh, breakable. If not, we're trying to carry this out. We're just trying to save inventory, save everything that we possibly can. We're feeling the heat. The windows start cracking out at the back of the building. They start to crack under the heat. And then we hear it. Not just hear it. We feel it. An explosion. There's an explosion. It shakes the entire building. It's coming off somewhere from that, this massive explosion. And then timber beams start hitting our building. That's how big this explosion was. Okay, who here is out of here? <laughs> Are you with me? We're out of here. That's, they were out of there by that time. It was like, okay, it is time to go. But that happened right where we stand. Now, I want to talk just briefly about the great St. John fire of 1877. And I'll let you know, I grew up in St. John, 21 years in St. John. And uh, I heard about the great St. John fire when I was in elementary school. I went to Champlain Heights Elementary School. Anyone from Champlain Heights Elementary? Hey, there we go. <laughs> okay, nice. So I went there and a friend of mine did a project on, uh, on uh, something related to the Great Fire. And I remember the teacher coming to us and saying, uh, yeah, there was a Great St. John Fire. It like burned down the entire uptown. I was like, it did what with the witch now? <laughs> I, it, I couldn't even fathom such a fire that would burn the entire uptown St. John. I went through the rest, like 30 more years, thinking I knew the story of the great St. John fire. Of course, I'm a St. Johner. I know the story. And I know there's some, who has read the Conwell and Stewart book? Okay, some of you really know the great St. John fire. But a lot of us, we know the beginning. There was a fire. We know the end. Fire went out. It's <laughs> not still going on. And it rebuilt, but we don't know the middle of the story. And this is why, uh, what the main reason I, I, I wrote this book is with our stories, like this is a well documented event. Like every once in a while, we have to blow off the dust from our stories and repackage them for a new generation so they're not lost. And this is why uh, why I, I wrote this book. That's the book. It's available uh, at the back. Thanks to Rose from the uh, McAllister Place Coles. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Uh, that's the last time we're going to talk about the book. We're talking about the story now. Let's get into the story of the Great St. John Fire and what we're going to do for the I'm blocking the screen all the time. To understand, and this is what I, what I learned when I'm doing the research, to understand the Great St. John Fire, you have to go back 100 years before it happened. Now, there's going to be a key phrase I'm going to be saying throughout this entire presentation. And it's going to be, that's a story unto itself. And when I say those words, and can people hear me without the... Mike, can you guys hear me with us? Uh, not, really. not really. Not really. Not really. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? Barely. Barely. Can you hear me now? Okay. Thank you. Okay. So uh, hopefully I won't get tripped up. I tend to walk around, uh, as you can see. Okay. So we have to start a hundred years now. The key phrase is going to be this 
That's a story unto itself. Okay, and that's a key for everyone in this room to look back at Greg Marquis and say, I want a presentation on that because we could talk about all these stories and have two hour presentations on every, every time I say that's a story unto itself. So let's look back to the beginnings of St. John. <laughs> and the uh, beginnings of St. John, we have to look back to when Champlain arrived and, uh, uh, and found a little Lusco uh, village. Um, and uh, so the important thing to know, this is not British land. This is not French land. This is belongs to the First Nations. And they were here thousands and thousands of years before uh, colonization. But then in that exact spot on the west side, and it's where Fort Latour is, that's where for the next couple of hundred years, it switched from British control to French control to British control to French control to British control, as you know, with the wars. And that is a story unto itself. <laughs> right. Everyone looked great. So that was the extent of it. There was no city here. There were forts and there were fights. And there were protected, there were, it was to protect. Then enter in, the British finally took control. They uh, had the last fort on the west side, which was the Fort Frederick, which they did the uh, St. John River campaign, which was the expulsion of the Cadians on the St. John River, um, uh, on the St. John River. And Greg, that is a story in and up unto itself. That is a huge story and, and something we definitely need to uh, reflect on. So um, 1765, American Revolution comes. And what the uh, US started going as they go uh, to uh, American ships, they go, yeah, if you want to go up to British North America and plunder anything you want, go for it. And they go, great. So they sent ships up and they went to the warehouses because there was a little bit of commerce up here. So there were some warehouses and they would go to the warehouses and they go, give us everything you have loaded onto the ship. And the people would say, no, we're not going to do that. Oh, yes, you are. <laughs> a couple of guns come out and they go, okay, yes, we are. Okay. And then the British go, oh, we can't let this continue. So in 1777, they built Fort Howe. So they built it up on a hill, not like down low where all the other forts were built, built up on a hill. And they had a hundred soldiers, Union Jack flying and cannons aimed at the harbor. So the same marauders came back when that building was, or that fort was completed and they go, this is easy pickings and sailing in, sailing in, sailing in. And then they go, what the heck is that? I'm turning around, turning around, turning around. And it never had to fire a single shot. <laughs> the presence of that thing up on the hill with all those soldiers and the cannons was enough that there was no more marauding of uh, St. John during the American Revolution. Now we go to the Loyalist Landing. Um, and the thing is, I grew up really with the loyalist myth, you know, that it was, uh, people coming to uh, the new city proud and under military escort, and they were going, had a dream of building the, the greatest uh, city. Yeah, not exact. <laughs> okay. So these were people who were exiled. Uh, during the American Revolution for being loyal to the British. And there was a lot of reasons for being loyal to the British. And that is a story unto itself. <laughs> so they came, but they were not all of British descent. So as you can see here, and they were not dressed to the nines like they were going to a picnic. They had a hard time in, in those ships. And there, they, there were black loyalists as well that came, came over. And the uh, black loyalists were ones who 
were uh, either fought for the British or sought British protection. Mm -hmm. And really what that was, was the British trying to disrupt the economy. So they were trying to encourage uh, enslaved people to leave uh, leave uh, their uh, their situation and to uh, come away. So, but that was only the ones who were enslaved to Americans. There were loyalists who came with their own enslaved people. And uh, Stephen Davidson, I believe, was here just a couple of days ago. Am I right with that? Yeah, uh, he says it well about being a loyalist. You, we have to accept the good, and we have to accept the bad. Like we can't, we can't just cover up and say, "Well, we don't want to even think about that part of our history." We have to accept it, and and the bad stuff, we make reparations. But there is good and, and there's bad, but enslaved people did come to uh, St. John. Now, the British said, we got a city ready for you. We got a city ready for you. Don't worry, you're coming from New York and Boston. You got a city waiting, uh, uh, ready for you. Guess what they saw when they got here? Fort Howe. <laughs> that was it. And they go, you got to be kidding. Sorry, I moved ahead. You got to be kidding. And this is a, a quote from uh, uh, Sir Leonard Tilly's grandmother who arrived here. And she had a young baby at the time when she was dropped off. And I'll read this to you. She goes, I climbed on top of a hill and watched out as the sails left into the distance. And such a feeling of loneliness came over me it was that as if though I had not shed a tear through the entire war. And I sat down on damp moss with my baby on my lap and I cried bitterly. Can you imagine what feeling that would be to see those sails just go and you're dumped off on a rock? So they had to get the work and they had to get the work quickly to make a rock into a city and we have the May fleet we know about, but they, people were still arriving in October. And you know St. John in the winter. We got time is not on our side. We got to build a city. So we're building a city and we're building it as quickly as possible. And we run out of time. Winter sets in. We have to spend the winter living in tents. A lot of us in tents. Can you imagine? living in a tent through the winter. A lot of people didn't make it. A lot of people died that first uh, winter in uh, St. John. And then a lot of other people went back to uh, America and say, oh yeah, that whole loyalist thing, you know, it was a phase. Um, would you mind taking me back? But some stayed. And they went on and they used hand tools and they hewed roads and they built started building a city uh, out of a barren rock. Now, a city divided against itself cannot stand. And what happened with this is there's always something going on. And what was discovered early on is the 55. Have people heard about the 55? Yeah. There's always someone trying to get a deal. There's always someone trying to get a deal. And the 55 were ones that made secret deals with the British to get the best land in the upper cove where we are. This was the place to be. If you were a 55er, you were in the lower cove, which you didn't want to be, or across the way in Carleton, which is not the place. So secret deals, and guess what? They were found out. So now there was loyalist versus loyalist fights, and they got violent. And it all came down to this lottery, which was supposed to be fair. And it was supposed to be fair to the Black loyalists, too, that they had every ability to get the same land. Yeah, no, it, the, the game was rigged from the day one. And then we started having a city divided by against itself instead of a city working together to tame the wilderness and build it into a city. And it got resolved 
See, this is good theme music for this. It got resolved <laughs> in uh, in the first election in night uh, in, uh, in in 1784, and um, that is a story unto itself. <laughs> Uh, the uh, it, a lot of shady things went on with that. It ended up that they had to delay the election for ten days because a riot broke out. <laughs> lots, lots of riots in St. John. Um, and this tavern, this Mauer Tavern, that is the first New Brunswick legislature, and that's where they passed the first laws ever in New Brunswick. And I bet they did not close down the bar. <laughs> But that's that's up, but that was up by Brunswick Square. Okay, and then they got to work godly people, and almost before they had houses, they built the churches. And this is the second Trinity Church. So the first one was a little farther down to Main Street, but this is in the exact location of the Trinity Church. And I want you to take a good look at that. Because it's we're going to come back to it. Okay, and then Guess what? The French and the British went back to war again, like they keep on doing. So they go, oh yeah, we probably can't just rely upon a fort on a hill. So that's when they started fortifying uh, uh, St. John. And we got uh, the military base. We have uh, batteries set up uh, all along. So the military base went in in uh, 1793, I believe. I believe it was when uh, the war came back. And then we have the War of 1812. And what uh, that's how we got Martello Tower. And how we got it is that the, uh, letters of Mark were given to New Brunswick vessels to go plummet, uh, go, sorry, pillage uh, American uh, towns. So they would go down and they would pillage and steal and all this kind of stuff. And then they go, yeah, they're probably going to look for revenge, aren't they? The Americans. Yeah, Let, let's build a let's build a, a tower with cannons that will protect us. So they built the, this. wasn't completed till the end of the war. Never shot a single uh, a cannon. But the war of uh, eighteen uh, twelve that started to shape the shape of town. But it was always this threat. It was always this fear that Saint John would be destroyed by war and from sea. Oh, it was destroyed but not in the way they thought it was going to be destroyed. So St. John started growing, and why did it grow? Because of the timber. So the timber was great. The virgin forests of, uh, of New Brunswick were fantastic, and they would cut it down. There was no uh, renewable uh, 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 resources back then. They didn't plant and uh, See, see about the future. They go, no, we're going to cut down this as fast as possible. So it started to thrive. So St. John, the little city, started to thrive economically uh, because of timber. But the problem was they had to use water mills to uh, saw it. So either you had to waste a lot of tonnage by sending out uh, not lumber, but timber, or you had to saw it up uh, when the river was uh, not frozen. And it took a lot of workers to be uh, doing this. So a lot of workers were needed. And you see how young some of these workers are? So it took a lot of workers and they were not treated well. And that leads us to 18... 49, when the first labor union or a semblance of a labor union was formed, where they finally got the 10 hour workday, because it was sunrise to sunset, they earned themselves a 10 hour workday, and uh, it would be signaled by the ringing of the labor bell down a market slip, which now the labor bell is. Lily Lake Pavilion, and if anyone can get me in today, I, I so want to see that. That is that is an incredible part of our Canadian history, uh, sitting at the Lily Lake Pavilion. If you haven't seen it, please go see it, because I, I will be in awe when I see this thing. Okay, so but that is, starts showing you, again, a city divided against itself, the merchant class, the working class. 
Now, sawmills came in steam powered in 1822. That changed everything. They could run those all year round, and they did. But they were run by steam, which had to be heated with coal and wood in a place that was producing combustible dust. How many of these burned out? A lot. And so this was really, really dangerous work. Okay, but they were into the export of, uh, of uh, lumber and everything was going great. St. John was on the go. It could not be stopped. And uh, this is St. John in 1825. Not bad in that brief period of time. So you can see, what is that? Right, right here? Stone Church. St. John Stone Church. And can anyone recognize this? St. Malachi St. Chapel. Yeah, chapel. The chapel. So yeah, it was growing in and it could not be stopped. Yeah, it could get stopped. Yeah, it could get stopped. So what happened? Um, it thrived so well because of British protective tariffs. So yeah, if you're British, you had to buy from New Brunswick. They protected the colonies. They left the those. And then St. John was in trouble. So it no longer had its steady supply. So St. John was looking bad in the 1840s. And then you bring in the Irish famine immigrants, which swamped the city and its resources. Uh, is uh, Jen Butler here today? Her dad, um, the late Ray Butler, uh, uh, painted this picture, and it's in the book. There, I've spent hours staring at this. There's so many stories. Like you see the main story of Dr. Collins, but there's so many other stories. But the Dr. Collins story is a story unto itself. <laughs> then you had, so we had the system of the uh, meager resources of the city, medical otherwise being taxed. You had um crop failure and then you had economic decline all hitting at the same time and uh, a lot of people from uh partridge island who died there are now at saint mary's cemetery which i went to yesterday just to take it in seems like a small cemetery except if you know behind all those graves right down the little river there's about six thousand bodies buried in unmarked graves and a lot of them were from partridge island and then sectarian violence. Let's let's make it more of a town divided against itself. So the Orange Order and the Irish Catholics, when uh, the Irish Catholics who survived to come over, they were placed in the ghettos of York Point. And there was the worst urban riot in 19th century British North America happened right up the street by the aquatic center. Well, people dead and many injured during an Orange Day parade and the Orangemen carried swords. So you can just imagine the type. And that really is a story unto itself, is the York Point riot of uh, 1849. So everyone thought it was over. St. John was done. St. John was done. But then someone came up with the idea, and this is the thing about St. John, it invents itself, it reinvents itself. And it reinvented itself They go, we've been shipping lumber to shipyards in England. Why don't we build ships ourselves? And they did, and they were good at it. They were the best. They became quickly the third largest shipbuilder in the world. And then they got even a better idea because they were building all these ships to go to England. They got a better idea. They go, oh, why don't we just not build ships? Why don't we run shipping companies? And then all the money for the shipping companies comes back to St. John. So it's not just like a one-time thing. Here's your ship, here's the money and stuff. 
constant flow of money. So St. John started getting rich again. Now, was the money divided amongst the elite and the poor equal treatment? No, no, it was not. So again, it was a city divided against itself. But this is a picture of the Alexander Yates. I'll tell you, every ship ends up like that. Every, every sail ship, eventually, that's going to be the, the demise. I looked up a lot of images on the uh, Brunswick Museum. Always the same way. <laughs> Off the coast, someplace, run aground. This is Reed's castle. He was one of the top shippers. And he accumulated a mass fortune in a very short period of time. This was on top of Mount Pleasant Hill. Burned down in 1912. A lot of things burned down in St. John. Mysterious circumstances. Okay, but that shows you the wealth. But there was as well great poverty in St. John, and that divided things up. And you see there, that's Reed's Castle, overlooking what was Portland at the time, which was a very, very poor uh, part of St. John, actually suffered its own Great Fire four months after the St. John Great Fire, did not get anywhere near the support of the Great St. John Fire, even though it was more in need. Okay. So that gives you a little, little taste of what's going on. Um, so there was sectarian violence. People were not getting down. One of the big uh, weapons of social discord was arson. So keep this in your mind as we go forward into the Great St. John Fire. So arson was constant. And it was used, again, to settle scores as well collect some insurance money. Well, let's go with this guy. <laughs> let's go with this guy in 1788. Oh, my God. This guy, just to let you know, was as hated in St. John as he was in the United States. Okay, he was really hated. So he was accused of starting the 1788 fire, which almost took down the lower code by burning down his own warehouse for the insurance money. And his partner goes, Shakuse to Benedict Garnell. Shakuse, you started the fire. And Benedict Garnell goes, That is slander, libel. I'm going to sue you. So Benedict Arnold ended up suing his business partner for slandering his reputation. So it went to court. So it went to court. And he was suing for 5,000 pounds. And the judge came back and goes, yeah, Munson Hoyt, the business partner, you haven't proven that uh, you're telling the truth. You haven't proven that uh, Benedict Arnold started the fire. You lose. Benedict Arnold, you win. And I guess in the courtroom just erupted, because they hated the guy. And then the judge announced the uh, judgment, the, the award, 20 shillings. Because <laughs> that's what the judge thought his uh, Benedict Arnold's reputation was worth. <laughs> there was a second mysterious fire in St. John that day. Benedict Arnold was burned in effigy outside of his home. He didn't last long in St. John. He went back to England and died there. Okay, there. Um, so we didn't have any warning that there was going to be a great fire of 1877. There weren't any other fires to give us some indication that, that St. John was in trouble, right? <laughs> wrong, wrong. Okay, there was about 13 uh, major fires that I counted. And one of the worst, this would have been the great fire. This was would have been what we're be talking about today. This was the second worst. It happened in January. Can you imagine? So the water was freezing in the buckets as they were trying to get it on the fire, and it ripped down the harbor front. And the only thing that stopped it was the Bank of New Brunswick. Keep that in mind when we get in the fire. Nothing can stop the Bank of New Brunswick. It's indestructible, is what they said. 
Nothing will ever as much as tarnish its walls. But that was, that was a great fire. And the harbor front, there were so many fires in the harbor front. So many fire after fire. And there was the fire of 1841. Five people lost their lives in that. And it taught a lesson that even stone and brick buildings with wooden roofs, they were vulnerable. The fire would go right through the roof and burn. So they knew this, this frailty of their buildings. And I want to say, most things were made out of wood. Most buildings were made out of wood. And even the stone ones had wooden roofs. And there was wooden adornments. And I mean, they were sandwiched together. They were sandwiched. Like, this is not a, uptown St. John is not a big place. It's about a square kilometer. And they sandwiched everything they possibly could. And guess what? There were no building codes. You could build any way you wanted, and they did. Again, trying to uh, just pack in as much as uh, possible and get the city to be something that would rival Boston, rival New York. Okay, so now I want to give you a taste just before we get into the fire, the fire of 1877 a taste of what St. John was like before the fire. What did we lose in St. John? This was the financial district. So you see here, that is the original bank of New Brunswick, which is indestructible, right? Can't, nothing can do that. Brand new post office, only one year old at the time of the fire. They were supposed to put a clock in it. They didn't get around to it. Unless it survives the yeah. fire of 1877. We'll find out soon. That's a that's a teaser to keep you here. <laughs> what's, what's going to happen to post office? This is the customs house or the custom house, the original one. And uh, it was uh, originally owned or partly owned by Alexander Keith. Fun fact for your next cocktail party. Did you know? Uh, if you have those kind of boring cocktail parties. Uh, so the uh, the federal government took it over after Confederation. And uh, so it was a federal government building. And then the streets were dirt. They were not paved. They were dirt. And you can see um, there were some walkways, some like stones uh, put down to try to make Crossing Street a little less of a muddy affair. But the sidewalks, if there were any, were made of wood. Is anyone going red flag going, wood, fire coming, <laughs> Okay, okay, good, good. Okay, so you, you get, you're getting what I, I want you to get from us. Okay, wow. Corner of Duke and Germain Street, the Victoria Hotel. So this was uh, built in uh, 1871. 200 rooms, water in each room, which was incredible, and a steam-powered elevator to take the guests between floors. This was considered the finest hotel in the Dominion. Let's see what happens to it. Okay, Academy of Music was a theater, 1,500 uh, people it could hold. And it was just a beautiful, beautiful theater. We have King Square, and you can see, again, I always like to point this out, what's this? St. Malachy's Chapel. <laughs> okay, so uh, what you have to know about King Square is a lot of people thought it was a waste of real estate. <laughs> They were going to divide it up into commercial lots. And there were plans to make it into a city hall. And as we're going to see, thank God they didn't uh, do uh, those things. The St. John Hotel, which was later named the United States Hotel at the time of the Great Fire. Why? I have no idea. Maybe ask Greg why, why they went with the United States Hotel. Uh, but interest, interesting, the Loyalist House found a um, uh, an invitation to a ball uh, from, I think it was 1840? 48. 48. 1848, that was held at the uh, St. John Hotel. So this had all the major events happened here. 
And this was on the uh, corner of uh, Charlotte and King Street. So where the RBC is uh, now. City Market, one year before the fire, it was built. What's going to happen to that? Well, you probably know because you might have walked past it today. So you probably go, I think it's going to be okay, Green, but I'm not sure. Okay, uh, Queen Square. This is where, this was the place to be. So John Boyd, uh, who would become Senator John Boyd lived here. Now you gotta know what was happening right at the, before the fire. Um, so remember I said St. John ends up going good and then bad and good and bad and good and bad re reinventing itself. The sixties were not great times for St. John. And one thing was the Fenians. So the Fenians were the predecessor of the Irish Republican Army, and their plan was to take British North America hostage to Free Ireland. And this is the Battle of Ridgeway, but they were going to take over St. John. Now, luckily, they were, uh, they were all amassed at the border of Maine, ready to go, but they were waiting for their guns to come in by ship. And that is a story unto itself. What happened? Okay, but that put the fear of God into New Brunswick. Like they were terrified that summer. And that really convinced them. That was what put them over top going, yeah, this confederation thing, I think it's a good idea. I think it's a really good idea because we need to uh, strengthen numbers, you know, uh, having uh, having the Canada's come down and protect us just in case, oh, I don't know, Fenians. Um, so that was one of the big things that put them over uh, at the top. But again, that's a story into, uh, unto itself. And they got their railway. So this was up in uh, and ready uh, operating in 1876, which it seemed like a good idea at the time. And, uh, any St. John's, there will be some groans going, yeah, yeah, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Okay, uh, so, but the Intercolonial Railway, so to link uh, the Maritimes with the, the Canada's, so the One Nation linked by railway. And this was the big blow, steamships. St. John was wood, steamships iron. As you can see with this steamship, they were awfully ugly to begin with. They had sails on them because the diesel engines, or sorry, the engines were so inefficient that they couldn't load enough uh, fuel and still have cargo. So they actually had to use a combo of, of the uh, steam engine and the sails. But around 1850, 1860, they started getting way better and they dominated the seas. And we got all our ships are wood and they're not as fast and they're not as strong. They end up getting shipwrecked all the time. And guess what? St. John's Harbor couldn't handle a steamship. Do, do, do. Things are looking bad for St. John. But then long depression. So this would have been the Great Depression, but you got outdone by the Great Depression. But this was a long depression that's a worldwide uh, economic depression that started in, uh, in 1873, arguably lasted until 1896, depending on the metrics. So it got hit, 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 St. John, hit, 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 bad times. But there was hope for the future. They go, no, we will come back. Everything will be fine. And then, 1877 came. They didn't see that coming. So you can see this fire happened at a bad time. Okay, any Kurt Russell fans here? Okay. Does anyone not know what I'm talking about? Escape from New York, escape from uh, uh, Los Angeles, do a few people? Okay, I, I'm getting a few nods. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to escape from St. John. Okay, so we're going to put ourselves in the situation and go, what would we do 
where would we go and what would our fate be depending on those choices that we have to make in a split second? So what we have to know about the Great St. John Fire, and this will blow your mind, is before the Great St. John Fire that June, June 20th is when it happened, three weeks without rain or fog in St. John. And people are saying, you are lying. <laughs> I must say, no, that's not possible. And I go, I thought so too, but three weeks without rain, unseasonably hot. Everything was tender dry. Okay, and this is an interesting part of Conwell's book, is that uh, all it says is an Indian chief, using the language at the time, but we know it would have been an elder, came to the city, on the Saturday before the fire and spoke to some kids and said, tell your parents St. John will be destroyed on Tuesday and leave. Now, he was chased off going, oh, that's crazy superstition. Kids went back to school and they said, we heard about this. And then they got lectured for believing in such superstition. The entire school got a lecture in this. Now, whether it was a, a premonition whether it was a spiritual thing that came to that elder, or maybe they just know the land and they know the conditions and they go, ah, three weeks without rain, it's tender dry, kind of feel a Northwest wind coming. And you got like a lot of stuff burning in the Northwest of your uh, city. So a lot of sawmills and stuff like that. I think you better get out. So we won't know, but the elder was wrong by one day. It happened on a Wednesday. So the elder was wrong by one day. Sorry, just two seconds. Sit with that for a second. One day off. So that's when you guys murmur, murmur, murmur. <laughs> Okay, so fire started at 2.30 in the afternoon. And the first alarm was sounded within two minutes. Now we gotta go and see before this, I wanna show you where the fire began. So the fire began in Henry Fairweather's uh, warehouse, which was a coal warehouse in a hay bale outside. So likely hay for the horses. So that's where it uh, began. Now what happened that afternoon was there was a strong northwest wind coming in. So it's coming in from this direction. And where is Henry Fairweather's warehouse on the peninsula? The northwest. So this is a perfect disaster uh, happening are ready to happen. So the hay bale caught on fire when there was 30 to 40 kilometer hour winds and everything was tender dry. The fire bells ring and as I said, five tolls five times and they chimed all around the city to say where the fire was and fire company number three from Union Street, they had their steam powered engines uh fire engines too and they will make short work of this so everyone was like oh this is going to be a minor affair so okay let's just see what we would do now who would get out of there right now you would get out of there okay the fires happen all the time <laughs> like little hay bale fires and stuff are we going to start running to the north every time there is a little fire and Let's imagine we have a business down here and we have a home in Queen Square. So what would you do? Would you take off? Because if you did get to the north that day, if you went right up the street, you'd be fine. But most people did not do that and would not do that because they go, they got it under control. So the firefighters came, they started dousing the uh, fire at the York Point at the uh, Fairweathers, 
but then it caught on to the boiler house next door. And that's what confounded the firefighters, is they would get it under control on one side, and then the fire would whip around the other side. Then they get it over there and whip around the other side. And while they were doing that, it was starting to catch fire here, 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 here. So before long, York Point was on fire. All the ships were on fire. It was spreading like no one's business. So now it's starting to spread. Let's see. Who, who amongst you would go up Union Street, run up Union Street, when you saw the fire spreading? It's okay to raise your hand. I don't want anyone sitting on the fence. Okay, some Union Street people, yeah, I'll take up. Who would go down and try to secure your stuff at your warehouse? No. Eh, here's the thing that you really have to know about 1877. Paper was everything. Your warehouse would have had your accounts receivable, mortgage documents, cash. If it burnt, you lost everything. You think the firefighters are going to have control. Who would go down and try to grab their stuff? A lot of St. Johners. Okay, so this was a really important part of the fires. A lot of people went down here, and you can see what happens once you get past Union Street. There's Nelson Street, which is no more. We're kind of standing on it now. Now, Robertson Place, but there's just no way out except this way once you get past this. Okay, so this is the Smite Street option. <clears throat> this is the Union Street option. So let's start off with the Smite Street option. So who's with me? You know what I'm going to do is I am going to pick on my brother because I just know he won't mind being picked on. So Paul, let's go to our business and let's save it. Let's go get those documents from those from that safe. So our accounts receivable, our mortgage documents, and let's get them to the bank in New Brunswick, because it's indestructible. Yeah. Okay. So we're going in. So we run down Smy Street. We go into that and we uh, and find we're going in. We grab this. It only takes two minutes. It only takes us two minutes. We go in, sun shining. Everything's fine. We're hearing the commotion, but everything's fine. We come out two minutes later, blackness. Cinders raining down on us. And then we hear an explosion and rocks the building. We talked about that explosion. Um, I'm going to geek out for a sec, if you don't mind. If I could get a little nerdy, I just, uh, the, the physics behind the Great Fire is, is just very interesting. So um, I'm a lawyer which means I know nothing. <laughs> I know absolutely nothing, but I talk to experts all the time in different fields and they give me enough that I can go to court and kind of get by uh, and, and understand, the, uh, understand the material enough. So I was talking to an occupational hygienist about the Great St. John Fire. And I said, yeah, it was a no fire, Northwest winds. And the guy was like, oh yeah, that's interesting stuff like that. And I go, yeah, and the historic record uh, noted several major explosions. And he goes, oh, yeah, 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 that's that's interesting. Then I go, yeah, the next day was really bad because, like, most of the food stores, including 60,000 barrels of flour, were destroyed. And that's when he did a COVID-friendly spit take yeah. <laughs> and said, what did you just say? 60,000 barrels of flour? He goes, that's your explosion. That's your explosion. So he goes, look for flour warehouses and coal warehouses. And I did. So you see the X's are the coal warehouses at the time, approximately. The uh, blue, uh, sorry, the red X's are the coal. The blue are the flour. And what happens, has anyone, uh, Fun with fire, uh, try to burn a bag of flour. You can't do it. 
you can't do it. So what would have happened was these, these barrels of flour uh, would have been in wooden barrels and the barrel would have burned away and then it would have left a column of flour. Now, if it stayed in a column, it would have been fine, but it didn't. So either the winds from outside or the winds of the fire itself threw all this stuff into a confined space of dust. And what you need for a dust explosion, you need oxygen, you need a confined space for a good dust explosion. You need fine powder that has a good surface area to it, which flour is really good. And then you have ignition. And what was our ignition? The fire coming in. So it matches the historic record. The historic record just says the fire got so hot, buildings started to explode. But no, the fire got so hot that anything that had the right amount of dust in it exploded and they exploded. Now it went subsonic. Uh, there's nothing in the historic record that says it went supersonic because a dust explosion can go supersonic. That's when the explosion force of explosion is faster than sound. That's what happened in the uh, Halifax explosion. It went supersonic. It went subsonic, but it blew. So these buildings blew up and sent burning debris into the air high above the city. And guess where it landed? It got caught up by the wind and it landed on the peninsula and the peninsula was burning in 13 places at the same time. This was what made this such a terrifying fire. A lot of times a fire comes in a wave and you go, there's a fire coming. We're going to run away. You were surrounded by fire before you even knew it. So it was burning all around and you're on a peninsula and you're stuck between flames and sea. So Paul, we got to get out of here. <laughs> okay, so we got to get out of the uh, warehouse uh, district with our ledgers and we're down here. So what we're going to do, Paul, if it's okay with you, I'm suggesting we go right down Smythe Street and then we head right along the uh, North uh, Market Wharf and straight to the safety of Market Square. Are you with me? Okay, excellent. Okay, so we're running, running, running down the street. Remember, it is pitch black. You're getting rained upon by cinders. And then after the explosion, there were timber beam burning timber beams falling on people. The first person to die in the Great St. John Fire died here. And you can imagine, like, you probably are saying, I'm, I'm surprised more people didn't die here. Okay, so uh, we're running and running and running, and people have everything that they can have, but then they start abandoning it along the way. Because they go, oh, I'm just running for my life. But what they abandon starts catching fires in the street. And now we have to navigate around that. But we see it, Paul, we see it. We see Mark and Wharf, we're going to make it. We're going to make it. We run out, there's a little bit of daylight. And then we get there and we go, oh crap. The fire flanked us. While we were going down Smythe, it was working Dock Street and Nelson Street. And you can see, just like today, look out the window, there's not a lot of room to maneuver here. And these uh, warehouses started burning. So we are stuck between uh, fire and sea. And the vessels in Mark and Slip all start catching on fire. And there's this mad rush to try to put out the flames. And one uh, sailor in this panic, he goes, we got to get free. We got to get free. And he jumps overboard with a tow rope in his, between his teeth and starts swimming. And he thinks he can swim a thousand ton vessel <laughs> holding a tow rope. But it moves. It moves. It's going. It's going. And he goes, huzzah, I did it. I did it. 
and the guys with the spike poles on the side pushing it out to sea go, I think maybe we had something to do with it, but he would not believe them. It was him and his tow rope and swimming ability that, that did it. Okay, but if you could get some of the vessels, might have, we might have been able to get on. But Paul, we didn't get on a vessel. We didn't get on a vessel. So we're on the side of the pier holding on. Okay, there's flames going above our heads. We're done, Paul. It's been nice knowing you. Bro. <laughs> Except the, this actually happened to, to two people. It was a man and a woman. And then out of the smoke comes a rowboat. A person who was born in Halifax came out to try to rescue people. And he rescues us. He takes us in a rowboat and he has to go through the heat. He has to go through the smoke to get there. And he dies three hours later in the smoke inhalation. But he saved two St. John's lives. So again, stories we need to remember and heroes we need to re remember. So that was our Smy Street option. Who was my Union Street person? Okay, you want to try your luck on Union Street? Okay, let's try our luck on Union Street. Okay, so we go up Union Street, but we're a little bit too late, because remember, this is where the fire started. It cut this way. So by the time we get to, to uh, Dock Street, which is now St. Patrick Street, and Mill Street is up there, it is, the heat is intense. The smoke, we gotta get out of it, out of here. We gotta get, we gotta get under shelter. We gotta get under shelter. So the story is three boys got trapped here and they went inside a store and they were scared to death and they just huddled by a counter in the store. I kind of, I wanna believe it was Rankin's Bakery. Just by the description, it didn't say, but I wanna believe it was Rankin's Bakery that they got caught in. Okay, so you can imagine three of them down on the counter going, as the flames and hearing everything coming outside, and they're looking at the door they just uh, uh, just uh, went through, going, it could burst into flames at any second. Any second this could go. It didn't. The flames came from behind them. The flames came in the back door. They run toward the front door to get out, they touch the doorknob, it's burning hot and flames start coming in. Then they run back and they make three other attempts. Then they feel it on their chest and on their body, the pressure like they've never felt before. And they go, this is it. Except it's not flames, it's water. Number three, fire department. So they saw the boys go in. They came with their hoses. Two of them were able to jump out the window. The other one crawled out, and both and all three survived. So Union Street's not looking great. <laughs> Union Street is not looking great. But let's see what happened on Union Street. Oh, I should say too, for the people in uh, who did have the foresight to make it to Market Square, that's when you're putting it, all your belongings into a horse cart, okay? And it was kind of like the Uber of the 1877. They ran off a of surge pricing. So during the Great Fire, they were charging $50 a load which would be kind of the equivalent to close to $1,500 to take your stuff a kilometer away or less than a kilometer away. Okay, before we go to the Battle of Union Street, I'll see you got a load of stuff. You paid $50. I don't know where you got it. We, won't, we don't want to ask questions in a fire. Uh, so you get on and uh, we're, um, we got to get our stuff somewhere. Who would take it to King Square and dump your stuff there, thinking King Square is safe? Couple hands, okay. 
How about Queen Square? That's even further farther away from the fire. Like no fire has ever come up the Queen Square. Who would go Queen Square? Anyone on Queen Square? Yeah, okay, Queen Square. Uh, let's go the water company on Linster Street. That's way far away and has spacious grounds that we can dump our stuff. Does that sound really good? Okay, okay. Loyalist burial ground? Maybe. Uh, there, funny enough, there wasn't much in the historic record about the uh, dumping of possessions in the Loyalist uh, burial ground. And I don't know if there was some respect going, that's not the place to store your stuff. I don't know. There probably was things stored there. Okay, so we'll get back to see what happens to our stuff. Because we paid a lot of money and it's all the stuff we have in the world. Right after we go to the battle for Union Street. Okay, the warehouse district was lost. Number three fire department goes, yeah, we're not going to be able to save this. We're going back up. We're going back up the hill on Union Street. But we are going to fight for Union Street. Because what's up Union Street? That's when you start getting into residential area. Okay, so the, if they did not save Union Street, the north side of the city is in danger. And if it got off the peninsula, <laughs> we don't know how, how much damaging this would be. So we do the battle for Union Street. So the first thing, let's go back to the, uh, the picture here, is right there is the McSweeney building. It was a lime uh, stone building, and it was considered like, oh, nothing could take this thing down. And it collapsed into itself. It absolutely collapsed and almost collapsed on a young girl. Her mother just saved her before the stone would have uh, buried the uh, child. It's interesting to know why that building collapsed and how we can kind of find out, and Greg Marquis might have some stuff to say about using a comparison fire to try to find out what happens, but I'm not a historian, but I did look at the uh, Great London Fire of 1666, and it did tell about these stone buildings that the mortar turned to liquid and just started dripping down the walls. And even the stone building, once the mortar's gone, it's going to collapse. So that's what likely started happening with all these stone buildings is the heat got so intense. Can you imagine that it melted the mortar between the stones? and caused the uh, building to uh, collapse. The other thing I learned from 1666 that is not in the historic record, it's been mentioned as a theory, but they didn't mention it at all. There would have been a lot of rats. Oh, there would have been a lot of rats, which would have made it much more terrifying because what do we know about rats in St. John? Well, they have a keen sense of danger. They really do. They, they know when it's dangerous and they bite when they're scared. And they would have been thousands of them blowing down the streets and into the harbor when people are trying to swim for it because that would have been the only way out of the Smith Street thing. So again, nothing in the historic record about the 1877 fire with rats, but after reading 1666 London, there were rats. There were a lot of rats, okay? So Union Street, this is fire company number three again. So they have their uh, fire engine and they are trying their best to put this out. They're trying to put the McSweeney building out. They can't put the McSweeney building out. It starts to march up Union Street and it's the flames are going higher than their hoses can get to. So building after building, collapse, 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 but they're holding their ground their fire engine almost caught on fire. The horses were spooked and they were just fighting inch and inch, but they were backing up, backing up, backing up. They were fighting a losing battle. It got so hot that they couldn't use their leather protection anymore. 
they had to go, let's forget that. We're going to, I, I'll sweat to death if we kept it on. So they started using boards to shield from the heat so they could get close enough to the flames to make their fire uh, hoses effective. And you can see with the rolling up sleeve, like the burns that they would have received. And they were losing at the battle. They were losing the battle. They were getting tired because they had already fought the uh, warehouse fire. And then this is like something out of a movie. They look down Union Street and out of the smoke, they see shadows and they're men. It's John Dunlop and the workmen from the shipyard, 25 fresh bodies ready to fight the fire. So the workmen and the firefighters go to battle to save the city of St. John, save the north side of St. John. And we can thank the 55, one of the 55, Lord Chipman, for having a uh, ridiculously sized lot. Look at the size of that lot. That's the Chipman estate. And that is not anywhere close to its original size. Uh, he donated the land for St. John Stone Church. Okay, so that caused... Thank goodness that happened because that gave a fire break on that side so that the firemen and the uh, workmen from the shipyard could focus on the uh, the uh, uh, north side, sorry, the south side of the street. So, which they did. And, oh, this was so cool. Guess where I stayed last night? <laughs> Chippen Hill Estates. I stayed at Pratt House. The house that saved the North End, and it was just a, such a surreal experience to stay within those walls because that's where the battle came. You know, we save these buildings, it's St. John North saved. If we lose them, it's over for the North End. It will just go because it's all wood past there. It was all wood. It would just burn, burn, burn. Okay, so they fought that fire, and several times the window sashes caught on fire, and men would climb up the building and rip the sashes, the burning sashes, with their bare hands. And they fought, and they fought, and they fought, and the fire finally relented. And they saved Union Street. So I want you to go check out those homes and just be like, oh, wow, the homes that saved. Uh, Union Street, the Battle of Union Street. Okay, oh, we're back. We're back. Remember, we have our stuff. Sadly, the uh, the uh, man from Halifax died. He let us off safely, but we have our stuff, and we have to get it to the Bank of New Brunswick because it is indestructible. Okay, so we are going down the financial district. So we're going down Prince William Street. We didn't want to go down Water Street. Not making that mistake, right? So that is always gets hit. So Prince William Street, we're going, we got to get to the bank. So we go running down, go running down, and Paul, this, this old man comes up to us and he goes, don't go any farther. Don't go to the bank in New Brunswick. This is going to burn it down. And Paul and I are like, <laughs> indestructible. That's not going to happen. He goes, listen to me. I was in the fire of 1937. This is nothing like that. This is going to burn this thing down. And we go, okay, guy. Yeah, thanks for the advice. So we end up, we go past... In, and we go to the uh, bank in New Brunswick where the manager is still taking deposits. So we deposit all of our uh, our financial documents, everything. Our entire life savings are in this satchel that we're putting in the bank in New Brunswick. Then we look around at the head of Prince William Street and we see the flames wrap around and we go, holy, you've got to be kidding. This massive amount of flames whip around at that uh, uh, head of Prince William Street. 
Okay, the Western Union Telegraph Office happened to be at the head of Union Street with the only telegraph in, in the city. The only telegraph, the only way to call for help. There was another one in Fairview and it was under repairs at the time. No way to call for help. It burns down. We'll get back to that because there is a, there's a lot of curses and there's a lot of miracles in this, but it burns through the ground. Anyone do any drinking at the uh, O'Leary's? Anyone? Come on, get off your pedestal. You know you've been there. Okay, you're drinking at O'Leary's. So in the Ritchie building. So that's the rebuild. The Ritchie building was a well-built building. It was incredibly built and it burned so well. It burned so well because it had a wooden roof, but you could see like how the walls withstood. It burned for seven hours. It was like a furnace. So everything inside did a slow burn. So next time you go to O'Leary's, just go seven hours of fire at this exact spot. Space time. Okay. The post office. Remember we were talking about the post office. Post office. Brand new post office. Yeah, it didn't make it. It didn't make it. But... At three o'clock in the afternoon, the postmaster general goes, I don't like the, I don't like this. This fire seems to be something different about this fire. So he ordered that all of the mail be put into bags and ready to go. And by six o'clock, he goes, it's ready to go. We got to get this out of here. And they all loaded it down two uh, boats waiting down by the harbor and not a single letter was lost. And you might go, oh, isn't that nice thing? Letters meant a lot, right? <laughs> they might have valuable documents in it and stuff. Like mail was very, very, very important back then. And the thing that this person saved every single piece of mail and was able to get it out the next day from a temporary office. But again, it's, found its way in, and how did it find its way in? It was stone, but it had beautiful wooden windows and doors, and they burned so nicely, and let the fire right inside, and when it was inside, everything was wood, and it burned. The indestructible bank of New Brunswick Hall, we made it. Oh. Oh, okay. So the Bank of New Brunswick was really, 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 can't stress this enough. Really, I guess I can. Okay, uh, strong in the front, but it wasn't as strong in the back. Fire came around the back. That burned this thing. It held $30 million at the time. And the hopes of St. Johnners. We'll get back to it. Customs building. The customs building. So it again, stone building, but had these weaknesses that the buyer exploited. And that was the wooden adornments, the windows, the doors, it found its way in. That's why a lot of times you travel around St. John, you do not see wood. It looks like wood, it's not actually wood. They learned their lesson about the wooden adornments not to do this. Okay, so it burned very well again, like a furnace. The Royal Hotel, this is uh, where uh, any St. John High School grads. Yay, Greyhound. Hey, there we go, Greyhounds. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, Ringo, can we do it? No, we'll do that later. Okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll do that later. So uh, this is where St. John High School uh, stood and it was the Royal Hotel. And it got hit early with those firebrands coming in from the explosions, but the people from the Royal Hotel put it out and they went, huzzah, we did it. And there was one stage manager that goes, yeah, it's coming back, I'm out of here. He grabs all the stuff, he's out of there and guess what, it did come back later on and that's all that was <laughs> left of it, the second time that it came. <laughs> okay, we're going King Street. 
We're going King Street. So this is a lot of people went from Dog Street and lived around the Dog Street. They were putting their hopes on King Street. And where were we trying to get to by our climb up King Street? King, King's Square. Yeah, we want to get uh, get there. So we're going up uh, King Street Hill. So thousands and thousands of people flooding up this. Now our hopes are on fire engine number two or fire engine house number two, which is still standing today. I probably shouldn't have said that because then I'm kind of giving away part of the story. But anyway, so we have that. Here's what happened. These steam powered fire engines were awesome. They were awesome, but they had to hire for the first time professional firefighters to keep them stoked 24 seven which cost a lot of money. And the city was like, eh, it's costing us a lot of money. How can we make up for this fiscal loss? Because we just want to make sure the books are balanced, right? You know, things are bad in St. John. We can't do this. Oh, let's get the fire horses working double duty doing road construction. So at the time of the fire, they were the horses were on Carmarthen Street doing road construction. They had to waste valuable time, and we don't know how much this impacted things, but the valuable time getting the fire horses back, and then they were exhausted by the time that they had to haul this big thing. That's the foot of King Street. That's the foot of King Street, so we can see the before and the after. Okay, so we're racing up King Street. And the fire is going up the north side. Now we think it's going to stop. We think that the Chippen Hill, which was Prince William Street at the time, uh, we think that that's going to cause a fire break. Fire just jumps it. Absolutely, it just jumps it. It was like it was like it was alive and it knew what it was doing. It jumped it and started a march up north. And the same difficulty if it took the north side of King Street then the North St. John is at peril and a lot of residential areas. Then it comes to MRAs. Who remembers MRAs? Then here we go. It is the building that saved St. John. Saved the north side of King Street uh, Hill and saved the north. But for uh, MRAs, City Market would have been burned. It would have gone down, no doubt. And maybe thousands of people killed in King Square. We'll see what happens, not get ahead of ourselves. But how did they save this? It was sandwiched together, same problem, same frailty, good, strong building, if you remember it, good, strong building, wooden roof. Well, they came up with an idea. They had a carpet department. And they started laying carpets on the roof and soaking them with water and putting them in layers. And a strange patchwork tapestry and fighting it for hours and the firefighters were there and it stopped. I like that music for that. It's like, but I will, it's happy. It's like, yes, we see. So, so we saved, um, so MRA saves the north side. Oh, the south side didn't go as well. The south side didn't go as well. So it actually entered the south side of King Street from Germain and Canterbury. So it burst into this out onto the people. So you can imagine you're running up this, you got the flames coming on the north side. I got to run, 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 and then blast from the other side. Now, it was so congested that some people were really close to the building and the cornices started to fall off the burning buildings and two people died when the cornices fall, fell off them. But people were trying to get up everything that they could up King Street Hill. There were no horses. Guess what people tried? They tried to, to take a horse cart full of all their belongings and haul it up by hand. 
What do you think their success? You walked up King Street without a horse cart. Yeah. Haven't you before? <laughs> Have you? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a tough walk to begin with. Try a horse cart loaded with everything you had. <laughs> Were they successful? No. 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 Did they leave a bunch of debris in the way that made it harder for other people to escape? Did that debris catch on fire? Yes. yes. So you can imagine the peril that was added to this. And it, it was kind of explained um, in uh, Stewart's book. It depends on how much, uh, how much uh, optimism you had. So there were lines of horse carts. Like somewhere at the bottom of the hill going, yeah, we're not even trying this. And then it was one a little closer to Danbury. And then no, we're not. And then uh, some at Germain going, oh, I, we were really optimistic about this, but no one made it that we're trying to haul those, those things. Okay, so it blasted up there. That is the head of King Street. Same exact angle of this shot. And you can see the lamppost in both of these shots. Okay, and we're going to get back to that because that's the St. John or United States Hotel. And that's right across from King Square where thousands of people are gathered. What's going to happen? Well, before that, let's go back to Germain Street. Anyone want to try their luck on Germain Street going out? Uh, King Street that I think is going to fall. I'm going to head down Germain Street. Because if you could, straight to the water, no takers on Jermaine? No. No takers on Jermaine. People know Jermaine was not the Jermaine was uh, one of the most devastating parts. We start with this. So uh, we start with Colonel Ray. Uh, Colonel Ray and uh, Captain Frank Hazen. So one of the first buildings to go was Trinity Church. You see that building there? Does that look at all like the the one that I showed you at the beginning. Yeah. It's the exact same building, but it doesn't look at all like it because it caught on fire in uh, 1849 and they had to haul the steeple down to save the church. They did save the church, but they put a new steeple on it and did some uh, renovations to it as well because of the fire of uh, 1849. Okay. Fire starts at the top of the steeple. It's it's taller than any fire uh, engine could get, any hose can get. They go in and the people were like watching Trinity burn. And Trinity to the people back then was like Trinity to us now. It's like, it was a beloved structure. And two men, Colonel Ray, who ended up being the mayor of St. John later, and Captain Frank Hazen went into the burning building to try to salvage anything they could. Colonel Ray comes out, he has some prayer books. That's the only thing he was able to save. But Captain Hazen had a bit better luck. He saved the coat of arms, the House of Hanover, which was rescued from the Boston State House. There's several stories about where it was. Some say stolen <laughs> during the retreat in the American Revolution, but we got it. We got it and it went to Trinity Church. So they saved that. And then they watched it burn. The people, they watched it burn and the bell and the clock that had been there since, uh, I believe it was installed in 1812. They crashed to the ground, and the final hour on the bell or on the clock was 5 p.m. And Trinity Church is no more. The old grammar school down the street. So this is where the best of the best of St. Johners would have received their education back in the day. It burned and burned quickly. The Academy of Music. The Academy, it's such a beautiful building. And unlike this, there was uh, this picture, there were no firefighters in that area to let the, to fight this fire. And it was full of props and props burned well. But the actors went in and they tried to save all of their costumes, which they did. And they took them out of the street and then thieves stole them. <laughs> all was lost. 
Germain Street Methodist Church, the fire wrapped it like a blanket. And it burned to the ground. And again, like these are meaningful, uh, like just so full of memories for the people of St. John at the time and watching them burn to the ground. St. Andrew's Kirk. So all they were able to get out of there was the uh, silver communion plates and it went down. The Victoria Hotel, the finest in the Dominion. So uh, again, I like this picture. It shows that the firefighters are fighting this fire. They were on, there was no fire fighting uh, in that area at the time. So it, it caught on fire, it burned, and people were trapped inside and they had to go through the smoky hallways trying to find their way out. They found their way out to the front door and they were greeted by a wall of flames. They had no choice. I can't imagine what it would be like. They had to jump through it. And people were jumping through the, the, the flames and then to say a lot of people died in this area. And that's the Germain Street Baptist Church that became the iconic image of the uh, St. John fire. It was the second Baptist, uh, Germain Street Baptist Church. They actually built a brick one. They tore down the original wooden one, much to the chagrin of most of the congregation or a big chunk of it. But they go, no, we got to take the wooden one down and make a brick one because it might catch on fire. Okay, let's go. The Queen Square. Who were who were my Queen Square people? Who were my Queen Square? Okay, Queen Square is far enough away from the fire. So people all day were loading their stuff. If you knew someone that owned a house there, you would have uh, uh, put it safely inside the house. If you didn't, it would have been loaded up in a heap on Queen Square. So all your stuff and the uh, women and children were guarded against thieves. Okay, so everything seemed fine, and then from the south, the wall of fire comes. And as fast as people were loading stuff in, they started loading things out. So they see the fire coming, and that's when a heartbreaking uh, uh, utterance from a young five-year-old boy at his grandfather's house, and he just looks out the window, he can't even speak to begin with, and then he says, Papa, Papa, come quickly. God is burning down the world and he won't make another. He won't make another. And he just cries and cries and he's inconsolable until they finally get him way away from the fire. So there's a bunch of people in Queen Square. The fire starts to wrap around. There is a woman and she's screaming. She goes, my baby is in the third floor of that house on fire, and a man actually scaled the building, went through the window of the burning house, went through the window of the burning house, and comes back two minutes later, baby in hand, and re reunites mother and child. There's another man named Monroe, a DR Monroe, and he arrives at Queen Square after being fighting the fire at York Point. And he was exhausted. He just lays down on the grass, goes, oh, I have had enough. And then the fire starts wrapping. He goes, I don't know what to do. And then he hears the screams of children going, Mom's on fire. Mommy's on fire. Mommy's on fire. Help her. Help her. And she is just standing there frozen and her clothes are on fire. So uh, Mr. Moreau jumps up and tries to get the fire out and wraps her with the uh, carpet and it won't go out. So he ends up ripping off her clothes, which again, back in that day, that was extreme to, to do that, but rips off her clothes and finally gets the fire going. And then she comes back to her senses when her, her two uh, little children start uh, holding her and uh, she starts to cry. And then by that time, Mr. Monroe takes a look around and everyone's gone, except one sailor. Everyone had fled and they were totally wrapped by fire. And Monroe goes, okay, we gotta build a shelter. So they grab some of the stuff the people did, made this makeshift shelter. Then an old woman comes out of the smoke and he goes, come, come with us. And the three of them huddle under that shelter for hours. 
but it wouldn't hold. The fire started taking down like the, it was candling of the trees. Started, the fire went down all the trees in Queen Square, but they wouldn't hold. So they all had to leave the shelter and go their separate ways through the burning streets of St. John to try to find their way out. And this is a cliffhanger because we don't know if they made it. We don't know if there's a lot of cliffhangers in the street. It reads like a novel. It really does. Okay, but that's a Queen Square. Okay, so Reed's Point is the next one. Be mindful of time. So Reed, Reed's Point is the uh, next one. So there are thousands of people gathered at Reed's Point. Some are trying to get out. So there's steamers coming in for the rescue. There's boats coming to, uh, to the rescue. People are trying to get out. But then some people are not trying to get out. There's a little party going on at Reed's Point. So there are people cheering on the fire and cheering on the destruction of their master's property. And uh, in his book, Stewart, it really condemns uh, the people in that area. But we got to remember that St. John was in the middle of a major labor dispute at the time. And you got to put things in context. Okay, so like, you know, they're not evil people, but it's just for the sake of being evil. It was probably for good reason that they did not uh, they they did not see the, the bad in this. But they drinks were flowing, and once drinks flowing, well, it kind of gets out of hand, fights were going on. And there was this one doctor who noticed, oh geez, there's a bunch of kerosene barrels, uh, cash of them sitting on the dock by thousands of people, and the fire's bearing down on them. So he goes in and he starts running around and goes, guys, I need some help. Let's push this in the harbor. Let's push in the harbor. And they were like, eh, you do it. I'm, uh, who are you? So no one will help him. He tries. He can't get it, to, get it to move. He finally convinces one boy to help him, but they can't do anything. And then the answer comes floating by, and it's a tugboat with a steam-powered water cannon. So the doctor waves his hands and to get the captain's attention, gets the captain's attention, captain sees the danger, and blasts those kerosene barrels and saves thousands of lives. Because that would have exploded. That would have exploded and killed everyone at Reed's Point. Okay, so um so trapped at Reed's Point. So uh here are some choices, and I'll see what you guys want to do. Who would want to get on a boat to escape Reed's Point? Yeah, okay. Yeah, Can everyone say, yes, I would want to get on a boat to get, get everyone? Yeah. Okay. I would want to get on a boat. Who would want to get on something like kind of that resembles a boat? <laughs> That's not bad. Who would want to get on one of these rafts? Well, guess what? The rafts were the only thing left. So people were jumping on rafts and they were at the mercy of the tides. And one pole of women and children started drifting out to sea and they would have been lost. But the fire shone a light on everything. And it shone red upon the raft and the schooner saw them and saved them. Then this is so incredible. Another raft had men and women on the side swimming it across to the west side of the harbor. And on board was a mother, or soon to be mother, giving a birth to a child in the middle of St. John Harbor, <laughs> in the middle of the great St. John Fire of 1877. Can you imagine that? Uh, even now, but back then, <laughs> Like you know, the at, at the best of times, childbirth was was dangerous, and I can't imagine both mother and child live. That's Reed's point after where the thousands stood. That was fine because again, the wind protected them. But that's what they came out at at four a.m when the, the smoke actually settled enough that they could go uh, go out. So that, you see the the uh, 
the three sisters lampposts. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can see how it's uh, it's the only thing that it stood. It stood, but it's uh, it's destroyed. And then the city of fire, the city of fire. So it was described by many as the most beautiful thing they've ever seen. And the Lord Byron quote was uh, used, and it was by heavens, what a beautiful sight to see for one who has no friend, no brother there. So if it wasn't for the destruction, the light, it shone off of everything. It danced off the water in brilliant colors. Millions of cinders floating through the air. The smoke would like blanket the city and then it would unveil it like a piece of art. And across the way on the west side, all the buildings glowed red. And you could see it from Moncton. You could see it from Fredericton. That's how much, that's how bright this fire was. This is how huge this fire was. Can you imagine? Let's get back to King Square. Okay, we left a lot of people in King Square. What's going to happen in King Square? Okay, so King Square now, this, sorry, this is the uh, St. John's Hotel. It's on fire. So people are seeing the fire coming. They don't know. They're just praying. And King Square now is being used as a shelter. It's being used to store uh, uh, goods as well. It's being used as a hospital and a temporary morgue. And the fire is coming. And this is the bell tower that was part of the fire alarm system in St. John. And it, doesn't it look like a nice stone tower? It wasn't stone, it was painted wood. Yeah, <laughs> I guess it looked really bad, shabby at the end. Uh, but uh, uh, an arm of fire went over and caught the bell uh, tower on fire. And everyone just went silent. And the silence was only broken by the final clang of the bell as it hit the ground. And then it started a wrap. Remember what happened in the Queen Square? Except we have thousands of people. So the same thing is going to happen. It starts wrapping and wraps down Charlotte. Heason Building is where the Admiral Beatty is now. Okay? It fought it. For some reason, it did not catch on fire. It stood. But the buildings next to it go down, go down, go down. They all go down. It wraps around. And then it gets to the fire station number two and the courthouse. And at that time, they uh, had some prisoners because the jail was right behind and the deputy let the prisoners out because they didn't want them to burn in their cells. Uh, and three took the chance to escape. So they go, thank you very much, I'm out of here, yay! And the next morning they came back and going, uh, yeah, the whole prison break thing. Uh, I'm so sorry about that. That was a misunderstanding. Please take me back because I don't like my chances of surviving in St. John right now. So please take me back into custody. So they all uh, return voluntarily the next day, but it stops. This is the miracle of King Square. It stops at the fire station. So it doesn't wrap around the north side. It doesn't take down the city market and the people of, in King Square are saved. The Loyalist Burial Grounds was another place where people huddled and they said there was not so much sadness as there was that night since the last of the bodies were laid the rest in that burial ground. But people came together and they huddled together, rich people, poor people, all through common suffering came together uh, in the Loyalist burial grounds and spent the night there. It ripped down Charlotte Street. So it went, it went south, more ways than one. It went south, it ripped down Charlotte Street. It ripped down Sydney Street. So this is St. David's Church. Took that down. 
Now, Victoria School, new school. Uh, again, St. John High grads here. This is, it eventually became St. John High, Victoria School. Um, so it was a big building with a big lot and everyone goes, this is going to stop the fire. And they all gathered around. They didn't even bother trying to get their stuff out this. there. It, this is going to stop the fire. And then the fire came and it started beating on the building, and they still go, it's going to stop the fire. Then all the windows, hundreds of windows burst out on the people, and they're still saying, it's going to stop the fire. And then the stones started falling, and people got seriously injured, and they go, this is not going to stop the fire. They tried to go back and get their stuff. It was too late. It was too late. This is what happened to the Victoria School. Okay. Leinster Street. Leinster Street. Let's go here. Leinster Street was far away from the fire, far enough away from the fire and upwind. So it was saved. And now who went for the water uh, cupping ground to put their stuff? Couple of people went for water cupping grounds. Okay, so water cupping grounds. So that was saved. A second St. John fire. So a fire springs up out of nowhere, and the historic record says no doubt in the minds of St. Johners, it was delivered and set. And it dooms the east side of the peninsula. So the fire, just like the original one, blown by wind, it started catching Mecklenburg Street before and after. Wiggins Orphanage, which was considered one of the nicest, most beautiful public buildings in New Brunswick at the time. Twelve orphans lived there. All were saved, but they couldn't save the building. But that's not the big problem. No, that's not the big problem. That's the big problem. What do you see right there? Gas plant. The gas plant. The gas plant. So the fire is just barreling down from Arthur. It is barreling down at the gas plant. There is a mountain of coal there. It catches on fire. And it actually burns for the next uh, seven days. So actually the St. John fire didn't technically stop until the last of the coals burned out. Fun fact. Uh, but that was fine because coal is combustible, but it gives a slow burn. But unlike what's in these big tanks, there was 100,000 square feet of gas and fire barreling down on it. If they caught, it would have blown the entire lower cove. And again, hundreds, possibly thousands of people would have died. One man, Robert Breton, stayed by his post. The historic record does not say how he did it, but uh, we assume that he released the gas. And by the, the time the gas plant did go down, but it didn't explode, thanks to Mr. Robert Breton and his efforts. He neglected his house at the time, which burned down and was completely uninsured. But I hope the people of St. John uh, chipped in uh, something to help Mr. Britton because he saved a lot of lives there. Then the lower cove, that is where the horror happened. People were trapped and the, the fire was going down one street. People would try to go one way, then the other way, they couldn't escape. Some just dropped through their knees and just prayed to God for salvation and going, this is it. It turned so hot that they didn't even need flames anymore to erupt this thing on fire uh, or erupt things on fire. The heat alone was enough to set it on fire. It warped trees. Can you imagine the heat that would take before your eyes and living through this? And a lot of people lived through it by putting carpets over their heads and staying low and luckily everyone was running water at the time to try to save the property and they were able to douse the carpets in water and kind of use them as a heat shield to get out of it. But a lot, uh, a lot of uh, suffering happened in the lower cove. 
This is the Turnbulls, just quickly to this mindful of uh, time, but this is one of the uh, uh, most heroic uh, and tragic stories of the fire. So uh, John Turnbull, sash factory. So he and his workers tried to save it. They were unsuccessful. Then John goes over to his uh, home across the street and he goes, I'm going to save them. And so John Turnbull, he goes, I am going to save it. And his son, James, is going, yeah, I'm by your side. We're going to save this. So James is uh, downstairs at the time. John is trying to put out the fire. And then the door opens. And James looks and he thinks it's a ghost. There's this ghostly apparition of an old woman at the door dressed in black and her bonnet's on fire. And then he realizes that's not a ghost, that's a person. So he runs to her, gets her uh, uh, the flames off, and she collapses into a chair. Then James goes, gets his, uh, his dad, John. They both come back and they go, we got to leave now. So John goes, forget the place. We got to save this woman. We got to leave now. And the woman says, no, no, leave me here. Don't send me back in those hellish streets. Don't, just let me die here. And James would have nothing to do with it. He grabs her and puts her over his shoulders, carries her out. She squirms out of her, his arms in the street. And again, she said, please, please just leave me. And they would not have none of the Turnbulls would have none nothing to do with that. They grab her again. John kind of creates a heat shield for James and the woman, and then they go down Main Street, which doesn't exist anymore on the peninsula, but did. So they're going down Main Street, and uh, for whatever reason, someone had put a thirty foot boat across the street, blocking the entire street. So they run into that boat and they go, "What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? What do we do?" I, I, I can't lift the, the lady anymore. We can't get her over this uh, this boat. We can't, we can't. And the lady makes the choice for them. And her head just goes back, lays back, and she dies with a smile on her face. They put her under the boat, hoping that would be enough to save the body. And then they look back, and the fire takes place. The boat and it becomes her pyre. And later on, they find out the identity of the lady. It's Mrs. Reed, the former mayor of St. John's mother that they were trying to save. And her two sisters died as well in the fire. Then there was the military bar barracks. We're almost to the end. We're almost to the end of the fire. The military barracks. It was bombarded right from the beginning by those flames in the air. And then the main part of the flames uh, uh, came and they fought hard against it. But the only thing that stood at the end was the ordinance building, which is still there today. And then the fire didn't stop until it hit ocean. And even then the fire was described as it would not die. It fought, it, it burned every blade of grass, every bush. It even seemed to light the ocean on fire, the steam coming from it. But finally, nine hours later, the fought Great St. John fire is out. Now the survival really begins. That is one of the maps. There's several different maps and uh, of what the fire damage was, and they're not the same. Uh, but here's one from uh, Stewart's book. And you can see the black areas is the devastation of the city. And the people, it was a it was a uh, hot day, but it was a cold night. And they had a huddle together, and they mo most didn't sleep a, a wink that night. And they woke up to what many describe as the most beautiful sunrise they had ever seen, but it was looking down on anything but St. John as they knew it was gone. You see people uh, handing out bread. Yeah, that didn't happen. The food stores had burned away. They only had three days worth of food. Fear of starvation kicked in. 
This is the two people navigating this uh, Princess Street Hill. And then this was the curse. This is unbelievable. You just can't write this stuff. It rained. It poured the day after, one day too late, but just in time to add to the misery of the people in St. John. And you can tell there's servants in Conwell's book that everyone was trying really hard. All the preachers were trying and the priests tried really hard to convince people that they were damned by God. It's everything coming at like raining the exact next day. So you can imagine that. People, the streets were unrecognizable. They had to use things like the Victoria Building, like big things that could be identified just to navigate themselves around the street. And then lawlessness. So there was thievery going on. There was drunkenness. And again, before we criticize people too much, the psychological trauma that people would have suffered. I, I can see it bringing a lot of people to the mob. Like uh, Stewart was very condemning of the lawlessness and the drunkenness, but it was a lot for people to go through. They were not hardier back then. They would have suffered the psychological trauma of this. The public hospital, so that's where the general hospital used to be, same spot, it got overwhelmed with casualties. They couldn't even keep records. But then there was the miracle. Remember the Western Telegraph burned down. The Western Telegraph burned down, the only way to call for help. But the operators saved the equipment, the instruments, and they brought it down to the train station in Portland, and they were able to get the wire, use the telegraph wire from the railway and their equipment to get a message out for help while the fire still burned and the world answered the call. It was in the newspapers all over North America the next day, and people were generous to the city of St. John. They poured in money. They poured in uh, lots from the Halifax uh, came came in of food, supplies, tents, everything. Even children started collecting toys and books for the children of St. John from uh, all, all around North America. So the world answered the call. And then there was the lost treasure. So the lost treasure, uh, the first thing were the children. So families got scattered. They didn't know who made it and who didn't. So the authorities started getting, gathering the lost children together and trying to reunite them with their parents. Some joyfully reunited. Others given the news that their parents had died and they are now orphans. And uh, 38 newly orphaned children were taken in by the Boston uh, Home for the Little Wanderers. That's our bank, Paul. That's where we ran to. We didn't listen to the guy saying, don't deposit your money there. But guess what? They dug through the debris and they found the vault intact. $30 million. Wow. Yeah. And they say, a lot of people say, but for that, St. John would not have been able to rebuild, but for that miracle. So the bank, not so much indestructible, but that vault, wow, that did the job. And here's another thing is people would, uh, when they saw the fire come, they would bury their uh, things under their cellars. So they're most valuable. And then they would go dig them up later. I don't know if you've heard this, and I don't know if it's still a St. John uh, a superstition, but when digging for treasure, one cannot utter a word when you dig for treasure. If you utter a single syllable, the treasure will be lost forever. Has anyone heard that as a superstition? I guess it's lost in time. But people believed that back then, so they would come at midnight hour and not say a word. And some found their stuff. Fine, others found absolutely nothing. Then there was the homeless. So this is the city... Uh, City Market would serve, serve as a homeless shelter. Uh, King Square for a very brief period of time. And then this is the Victoria Skating Rink, which is 
where the Colonial Inn used to be, which is now the Days Inn. I'm dating myself here, but uh, that's where that that used to, and that became the homeless shelter. Then there was Murphy Town. So eventually, people would uh, the city was trying to get people uh, any accommodations that they possibly could. And if someone was willing to take them in that didn't have a burnout house, they would go there. If someone knew of a farmhouse outside a city willing to take them in, city paid for the transportation. But then there were the people that no one would take. And they got them all down to the, uh, the military grounds. And they called it Murphy Town after the man who was running the place. And it was not a nice place. It went to lawlessness very fast. Uh, groups, gangs would steal from men and uh, from women and children as they were trying to get rations, uh, as well as they would go under their tents, reach under their tents and grab like the meager, meager possessions that they were able to save. So all those kind of uh, things happened there. It was a horrible, horrible living conditions. And then this reminded me of something, the, the Ukrainian war. Do you remember the story just from uh, the start of the war about the child in the subway tunnel? And all of a sudden, like there's bombs dropping from the Russians, and all of a sudden she starts singing, Let It Go. And just a beautiful little voice. And everyone just starts smiling and clapping and singing along. And it's just like something about our humanity that we need those those moments, even in the worst and most dire situation. Murphy Town, a man gets his accordion out and starts playing. And soon everyone was singing and dancing under the moonlight and had that one moment of reprieve of their supper. The St. John Relief uh, Society with uh, Sylvester Earle, the mayor, he ran that. So uh, at first it was a free-for-all. You could get about anything you want because their philosophy is rather uh, a, what, a hundred uh, people undeserving get away with it than one needy person go without. So that worked out for a while, but... Once more and more stuff came in, they knew that they needed to have a system, and they started the St. John Relief Society, which was started by, they went to Chicago, uh, Great Spire of Chicago. They had the Chicago Relief Society, so the person who operated that set up the St. John Relief Society for giving relief to people. Then the HMS Angus came in from Halifax with the 97. And along with the local uh, soldiers, they were there to with, with uh, to uh, restore law and order, and did a great job. So they brought the city again under lawful order, and they were able to recover most of the stolen goods, which was incredible. And the ironic thing is, the thieves saved a lot of stuff for being burned. Go hug a thief today. I don't know. <laughs> okay, the businesses. This is King Square. So now it's time to get back to business. So they have these business shanties. Can you imagine King Square like this? And Market Square was the same way. And then there was a bunch of lots all over the place. So uh, they were uh, given only till May of 1878. And then it had to come down. But they were allowed these temporary business shanties. Insurance. So it was great if you had insurance from a company like Lloyd's of London. That was great. But if you had a local insurance company, you were screwed because of universal law. So it depended on the uh, insurance company. Then there was the demolition work. And that was very dangerous work that uh, needed to be done. And a lot of people died in the demolition. But that's a story unto itself. I'll, I'll leave that, that one right now. The rebuild. So they were in St. John, at least, they go never again. Building codes came in for the first time. So in September, there was emergency uh, meeting of the legislature and they passed new building codes with uh, even stricter enforcement. 
So they widened streets. So this is Dock Street uh, afterwards. So it was widened. Uh, Canterbury Street, it only ran to uh, Princess. It was a short little street. They ran it the whole way. So they widened everything. Then there was a public rebuild. That happened really quick because the government of Canada kicked in money really quick. Uh, do they now? But anyway, we won't get into that. That's a different thing. Uh, so this is the rebuilt customs house, and it was considered the finest custom house in North America and second to none in the world. Okay, and they said this would last for centuries. We'll get back to that. Okay, then there was the private rebuild, and that happened fast, but they had to secure money quick, and they had to secure it at low interest rates to make it affordable to rebuild. But within four months of the fire, there were 700 buildings under reconstruction. St. John was dedicated to not letting this keep it down. This is Prince William Street, so that's the new post office that came in, first iron frame building in St. John. They were determined not to let that burn. This is the uh, new uh, bank in New Brunswick, still standing today. St. John Globe was back up in, uh, in uh, within a year because all the newspapers burned down. Market slipped a few years after the fire restored. King Street restored. The churches, the churches all went back up. So we see this is the uh, Germain Street Baptist right here. This is St. Andrews. This is Trinity. St. Andrews. It's sad. I went to St. Andrews. Yes, sir. I have. Um, but go around the side of St. Andrews when you have an opportunity and touch the wall. You're going to see brick. Guess where that brick was bought? From the Victoria Hotel. They bought 100,000 bricks from the Victoria Hotel to rebuild the Kirk. So you can touch the Victoria Hotel, the remnants. Germain Street was rebuilt and it became the shopping street for a while instead of uh, King Street because it was nice and flat. It was really nice that way. Victoria School went back up. Wiggins Orphanage went back up. Um, uh, Simeon Jones, one of the mayors of uh, St. John, built castle, his castle, which still stands today. Queen Square and John Boyd's house went back up. And within five years of the fire, St. John was completely rebuilt. There was the odd foundation up until, I believe, 1956 that still remained, uh, burned out, but it was completely restored. And that brings us to the final, and thanks for your indulgence by going over uh, just a little bit. But that is your point today. Go down to the electrical substation. That is ground zero of the Great St. John Fire. The artifact, has everyone seen that in King's, King Square? The piece of metal that is supposedly was uh, was forged in the furnace of the Great St. John Fire from one of the hardware stores. So that's in King Square. Our two buildings still standing today. Awesome night last night. I was just in, in, in heaven just being in, in, in this building, but the homes that saved Union Street still standing. Does that guy look familiar? There's some weird carvings on the Chubb building. And one is unmistakable, and that is Earl, Mayor Earl. And whether it's a condemnation or a praise, we don't know, because supposedly, supposedly he wasn't well-liked. He didn't get a second term. Let's just say that. Okay, the customs house that will stand for centuries can be seen on Sheldon's uh, Point walking trail. <laughs> it lasted till... 1960 and was torn down and the contractor used it to shore up his property. So if you go out by the Irving Nature Park, you can see some of the finest 19th century stonework just laying in a field. I had a person in the Halifax uh, presentation ask me, does the New Brunswick Museum have a, a display on the Great St. John Fire? Can I see artifacts? 
I go, just go to St. John. The whole city is a museum to the Great St. John Fire, if you know what you're looking for. The door at Duke Street. So the house didn't survive. The door did. They built the door, uh, the house around the original door. So you can go see that. Reed's Point. <clears throat> Three sisters lamppost, not exactly in the same position, but uh, back in the business and still, yeah, if you if you line up those three lights with the Trinity steeple, and you can see all three lights at the same time, as its original use, it's safe travel into the harbor, and everything is good in St. John. Germain Street Baptist Church, no longer uh, a church. Like you can go see, and it still has the original door on it. City Market saved again. MRAs, MRAs. Thank you so much. The Ordnance Building can be still seen uh, today, and St. John has not forgotten. This is the mural by the uh, Loyalist House to the St. John Fire. So St. John has not forgotten, and St. John Stone Church. This church has seen a city rise and fall and rise again. And it stands on its perch forever looking over the city of St. John. I hope it never goes away. <clears throat> that is what our loyalist ancestors set out to do. They set out to build a city like Boston. I love St. John. I love that there's not skyscrapers everywhere. There is a feel. Do people agree? There's a feel in this. There's a feel in this town, and I am glad. I'm not saying we can be prosperous, and that takes us to this. The ending is the beginning. Because we're just at the beginning of St. John's history. And you are part of St. John's history. And the things you do now, and people will be writing about you a hundred years from now. Remember what I said in the 1800s? St. John invented itself, reinvented itself, invented itself, went through tough times, good times, tough times. It's always been like that. And St. Johners have always found their way through it. And you guys will bring us through this. And what they, do, what you do, um, they will be talking about for hundreds of years from now. And this is sad. I want to say this is sad. We can't save all the buildings. I want to. Like, I am the most sentimental. Paul can attest to this. I'm the most uh, sentimental person. And we cannot save all the buildings. But what we can do is we can save the stories. And that's what gives buildings meaning, doesn't it? Like a building in and of itself without any stories. What is it? It's just a building. But where are the stories? They're in you. And a lot of St. Johners have taken it to writing books and blogs about their accounts of different stories growing up. St. Peter's Church, St. Peter's School, all those kind of things. And they're keeping those stories alive. And that's what I want us to do. I want us to build and continue to reinvent, but don't forget about the past. And please, 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 if you know some stories and know the history, get it out of your head and on to a piece of paper. Let's preserve our history. Thank you very much. Uh, again, I want to uh, thank you all for, for coming, and I want to thank uh, Mr. Green for a fantastic presentation. Uh, I'm a transplant to St. John. I, I come from upriver. river. Okay. I, I, bet, uh, I thought I knew about the St. John fire as well, but yeah, lots of fascinating stuff here. Uh, uh, before I, I turn it back over to Mr. Green for his Q&A, uh, I just want to remind you folks that uh, Brisbane uh, Historical Society uh, from, I guess, uh, from uh, the hiatus we had from uh, that thing we called the, the COVID pandemic. Um, we're, we're getting back into our uh, speaker series, and uh, Mr. Green's our, been our first one in, uh, in our new season. And so keep an eye out on social media and on uh, CBC radio. 
uh, for our, our next one to be coming up in uh, January uh, here at the, at the museum. I don't I don't think we're going to have time for Q&A. Oh, I know okay. some people want to have books signed, right? Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> and so maybe you can talk, okay. can talk to our speaker, with oh, speaker individually, but we have a few books that were sold if you'd like to sign a few. Okay, awesome. I, if I could just have five minutes, uh, and is there a washer? Yeah, 